So good afternoon to everybody. Um, let me recall slightly what we had done earlier, but very quickly, <coughs> because of course there were some holidays between the last time we met and today. So the point is that we started to construct from every topological space X a complete lattice of open sets of X ordered by inclusion. And the question was, can you find uh, a, an inverse construction? So we start, and that complete lattice, by the way, was also, in fact, a frame, which is even better. Uh, so now the question is, we start from a complete lattice or a frame. The frame gives better results. Um, let me say it's a frame ordered by some uh, ordering, which I will always write less than or equal to. So every post set is ordered by less than or equal to, except when I need some other notation. And uh, we'll try to go the other way. And what we had done earlier is to define a new set, PT of L, PT for point. So it's just a set of points of L. But a point of L is not an element. It's a much more complicated uh, uh, notion. And we had seen that by imitation of the fact that we can retrieve for each point, small x in x, there is uh, the so-called open neighborhood filter of x, so nx. And that is the set of open sets that contain x. And we had observed that uh, that notion only depends on the open sets. So it's a good candidate for defining a point solely from open sets, solely from elements of the frame. Um, and we had discovered that uh, the, the, the typical properties of that kind of object were that a, it was a completely prime filter Uh, meaning, uh, well, filter means uh, the top element of the lattice is in the filter. So let me call it x. I will identify x with nx, essentially. Uh, it's a bit strange, but uh, I'm going to call a point. It's, it's a filter, so it's an element. It's a, sorry, it's a set of elements of L, but um, I want to reconstruct these as actual points of a topological space. So let's start calling them x, just like the points of the original space x. So small x is actually a set of elements. It must contain top. Uh, it must be upwards closed. So if you take any element in x, every element larger than that element, then that element is again in x. And if you take any two elements of x, then their infimum is in x. And completely prime is an additional property, which is that if you take any family of elements of L, if the supremum of that family is in the filter, to be completely prime means that some element must already be in the filter. Uh, by the way, it would be useful to realize that um, if that implication holds, then that is an equivalence Mod modulo all the other properties. In fact, if and only if. And the reason is if for some i, ui is an x, then ui is below the supremum of all the uis. And since that's an upper set, that supremum must also be in x. So in a completely prime filter, it's equivalent to have these two properties. And the last thing we had done earlier was to set up a topology on PT of L. I hope I had mentioned it before the hot days. No, no, perhaps not. Anyway, that doesn't. Uh, 
whether I mentioned what the topology would be on that space of points. I think I said what the idea was. The idea is um, for each uh, element of L, so remember that L should be like uh, the open set lattice of the space I'm constructing. So at least there should be a kind of bijection between the elements of L and the open sets of the topology. And the idea is that, uh, so the open set of, open sets of the space of points, so that bijection should map every element of L to some open set. And that open set is something I'm going to write O sub U. So it's the same curly O, but I hope you, you realize in which case I'm using curly O without a subscript and curly O with a subscript. And it's defined in such a way that um, a point here is going to be in the corresponding open set OU. If and only if, and then what can you say? Well, if you imagine that X should have been the neighborhood of open filters of X, then the condition should be of the form X in U, and where I pre previously used big U, and now I'm using small U. Uh, sorry, X is in U, if and only if U is in that set. So, and that set I reused it as naming it X. So it's a bit uh, makes your brain uh, yes. go wide. Okay, but. If you don't understand anything, there's always still something you can do, which is type checking. <laughs> that is, try to write a formula that has a meaning. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the only formula that has a meaning, considering that u is an element of L and that x is a set of elements of L, is to say that u should belong to x. So the other uh, formula that would have a meaning is u is not in x, but that's out of the question. <laughs> right. So by definition, if you prefer, I want this to happen. So OU should be the set of points, that is a set of completely prime filters. But uh, after some time to understand mathematics, you should forget definitions and just remember the character, uh, characteristic properties. And uh, so the set of points of L, elements of that new space, well, such that X is in OU, which I want to be equivalent to B, sorry, which I want to be equivalent to U is in X. So that's it, I'm going to define OU uh, as the set of points which contain you. So that reverses membership. What I hadn't proved last time is that it is actually a topology. Um, what you do usually in topology uh, in that kind of case is you say, oh, I want this kind of set to be open. And then you say, my topology is going to be the smallest one that contains these sets. Okay? And then you know that all the open sets are going to be slightly complicated objects. They are going to be arbitrary unions of finite intersections of those uh, sub-basic sets, as they are being called. But in that case, we don't need to make that completion process. This is already a topology. And let me show you why. You have to show that it's closed in the finite intersections and arbitrary unions. Let me start with finite intersection. Um, so the intersection of finitely many objects, how many? Well, that can be zero, one, two, or more. Okay. The case of zero objects has to be dealt with separately, and certainly it shouldn't be forgotten. The case of one doesn't need any special treatment. And the other cases are obtained from the binary case by induction. Okay? So let me deal with a zero array intersection case. So the infimum of an empty family is just the top element. So what I need to show is that um, the there is a OU, uh, which is actually the set of all points. Well, if you want to look for one, I don't just want a bijection here. It should be an order isomorphism. So that, that is, it should, if U is below V, OU should be included in OV, which you can check actually. 
and conversely. So if I want the top element, a nice idea would be to, would be to check O sub top. Okay, so what is O sub top? It's a set of points such that top is in X. Oh, but top is in every filter. Okay, so that's really the set. Every point satisfies that. So it's really the set of all points, which is the whole set. Okay, binary intersections. Well, we don't just want, well, an order isomorphism. So it's an isomorphism between cosets. It preserves order in one direction, it preserves order in the other direction. You can check that if there are suprema, they must be preserved as well, and if there are infima, they must be preserved as well, which is not true of a simply a monotonic map. If, but if it's bijective and monotonic in both directions, then every order based uh, notion must be preserved as well. So one guess we might have is again that uh, the intersection of OU and OV should be O infimum of U and V. So let us check that. Uh, perhaps before I should say that a consequence of these two things is that, you know, here I wrote if U and V are in X, then their inf is in X. But the, this is actually an equivalence. So for all U, V, U in X and V in X is equivalent to U and V is in X. The reason is that from U in X and V in X, you can deduce that U and V is in X by this property. And conversely, if U and V is in X, well, U and V is below U, and X is upwards close, so U must be in X, and similarly for V. So that is an equivalent. Now we use that. Yeah. Jean, you could yeah. actually replace, I mean, I'm not suggesting you do, but you could replace the, the last two uh, oh, yes, you points could. by this, just by one. Yeah, you, you could replace these two conditions by just one condition. It's just that the tradition is to state them in, in this way. So for example, I could have said the same thing by replacing all three of them by saying for any finite family, the infimum of that fi fi finite family is in X, if and only if all of them are in X. So U sub U and V is a set of completely prime filters such that U and V, sorry, U and V is in X. And as we have just observed, this is exactly, that, that condition is exactly equivalent to U is in X and V is in X. And so that is the intersection of OU and OV. So in particular, finite intersections can be written as sets of from O sub something. And as you see, this is very neat mathematics, okay? This, just like uh, algebra, every, everything fits directly into its proper slot. Uh, my impression of that kind of mathematics is, you know that um, toy for babies where babies have, you know, kind of a piece of uh, plastic with a square hole, a round hole, a triangular hole, and then they have a square block, a circular block, a triangular block, and they have to learn how to put blocks into holes. And analysis in mathematics is completely different. <laughs> all the blocks have completely different shapes for, for, from all the holes, but somehow you can find a way of putting the blocks into some holes because they fit, uh, here they fit snugly, so we need something, we have it exactly. That's exactly your baby toy. <laughs> so, final thing, arbitrary union. We have that O sub the supremum of a family UI is the set of completely prime filters, X, such that the supremum of the UIs is in X. And as we have observed here, that the supremum of UI is in X if and only if there is an I such that UI is in X. That is an equivalence. Okay. This can be rewritten because I'm only taking a set of completely prime things. 
uh, as the set of x's such that there is an i such that ui is in x, and you know that the set of x's such that there exists an i is the union over i of the set of x's satisfying the remaining condition, ui is in x, and that is just OUI. So that in particular shows that any union of OUIs is, a, is an O of something. So that is a topology. That, yes? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Uh, the, the name is completely crime, makes me think that there is a notion of prime. Yes. Um, what, what is it? Uh, the, the notion of prime is the same notion, but for finite unions, finite suprema. And uh, as usual, you have empty suprema. So we always have to start from that because that's the least of, uh, comprehensible thing. For an empty family, that means bottom is in X if and only if false. So that means bottom is not in X. Okay. And then you need the binary case, which says that if the suprema of two things is in the filter, one of them should already be in the filter. And um, the, the notion, the reason why it's called prime, there are prime filters and there's a dual notion of prime ideals, uh, is so it's an, something that I have not um, revised, so I'm not sure what I'm going to say, but if you take the set of natural numbers with a div divisibility ordering, that, that is actually an ordering, where zero is the top element by here. Um, which is a bit funny to... Uh, I don't remember, but I think that um, it's something like a um, filter. So a filter is typically something like, uh, well, the usual, well, almost usual notion of an ideal is stable by, it's a set of numbers that is non-empty and stable by multiplication by any number. And um, a prime filter, um, well, it should be, but uh, you should check that. Maybe I'm saying something stupid, but it should be the set of multiples of a prime number. So anyway, the name prime comes from primality, whatever you do. And completely prime, it's because it looks like prime, except it also involves an infinite unions and infinite supremum. Okay, uh, but we have proved more. It's uh, not only is that a topology, but the map from U to OU preserves all binary um, infima and all suprema. So that is actually what I've called last time a frame of homomorphism. Okay, now the question is, uh, my original question was, we start from X, you get a frame L, you get back, you get back to the space X. Okay. You do the, the round trip, uh, you do the back and forth uh, journey. So you start from a space, do the back and forth argument uh, construction, you get back X. Well, you'll be disappointed if the answer is no in general. <laughs> um, first, last time we had talked about T0 spaces. So a T0 space is a space in which if two points have the same open neighborhood, then they are equal. So um, you can check yes. that O, sorry, not O. If you start from a topological space X and you do what we're interested in now, so PT of O of X, we want to compare that with X. And you realize that this space always has some properties that a general space need not have. So typically, that is always T0. So I used a definition of T0, which is uh, a space is T0 if and only if, if you take any two points which have the same open neighborhoods, they must be equal. Mm -hmm. So let me take any two points in Pt of O of X, and assume that they have exactly the same neighborhoods. And that means such that we know that the, the open sets are exactly the sets of the form O sub U. Okay? 
So that means that for every u in L, L being O of x, x is in OU, if and only if y is in OU. Oh, let me also remind you that the small u's, which I've taken as elements of a lattice L, uh, are things that I used to write big U when they were open sets from a logical space. So let me switch to that old notation. Big U, big U, big U. And let me remind you that X is in O big U if and only if uh, big U is in X. That means big U is in X if and only if big U is in Y. So what I've said is that every two element points that have the same open neighborhoods have the same elements. They are sets which contain the same elements, so they are equal. So if you take, if you start from a space which is not T0, let me give you a stupid example, two points, And the, let me call them AB, and the only open sets are MT and AB. That's the so called indiscrete topology. It's a topology where open sets don't distinguish between any element. It's one of the most stupid topologies. Well, that is not T0. Okay? I have two distinct elements, A and B, which still have the same open neighborhood or neighborhood, there's only one. So that's not a T0 space. So PT of O of X can't be X. In fact, if you do the construction, you realize that, okay, O of X is just bottom, which is empty, and top, which is the whole set AB. Now you look at the completely prime filters. Well, as I said, um, in a prime filter, you can't find bottom. A completely prime filter is more demanding, so bottom is not part of any completely prime filter. And it should be upward closed and non-empty. So there's really only one possibility, which is that set, and then you check that it's a completely prime filter. So if you do that round trip construction, starting from two points, but two points that you can't distinguish, well, essentially, it has merged them into one. I see you frown. Uh, no? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, there is a construction that does that, which starts from a general space, not necessarily T0, and uh, collapses all those indistinguishable elements into one. Uh, that's something that I... Um, often called the uh, T0 quotient of a space. It has a universal property in the category theory uh, with respect to the category of T0 spaces, which says what it does. And uh, that does it in particular, but that is not the only thing it does. So there are other things that may go wrong. Even if you start from a T0 space, you may fail to retrieve the original space X. Okay. So let me Take a more complicated second example. Excuse me? As many as three elements? No, three won't be enough. Oh, okay. uh, really any finite number of elements will fail to be enough. So it's really complicated. Not really. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me start from the natural numbers with its usual ordering. So that's a set you can look at as follows, 0, below 1, below 2, below 3, at some point I'll st stop, you have to tell me, no, no, okay, I'll stop uh, myself. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to equip that with the Alexandrov topology. Which means that the open subsets are exactly the upwards closed subsets. So what are they? Well, there is the empty set, so um, that is the space X. 
that is the lattice L of open sets. So I have a bottom element, which is the empty set. I have a top element, which is the whole set. And then I have a largest, uh, so, and then I have all upward closures of points. So I have the set, whatever is open, whatever is above zero. And that is also th this thing. There is a set of elements above one, which is included and properly included in this one. So it is smaller in the inclusion ordering. If I say something stupid, please tell me. It can happen. <laughs> Then there is upward closure of 2, upward closure of etc., upward closure of n in general. And this is an infinite chain with, uh, with no... Um, it doesn't stop. And then below all that you have bottom, which I'll just put actually below. Yeah. So what are the completely prime filters here? As I said, you can't have bottom. Then it's always a upwards closed set, and it's not empty. So it should have, let me change colors. It should have that kind of shape. Uh, okay. That is one of the possible shapes, and that is a shape, an upwards closed set, will have if it's bounded below, okay? If at some point you won't see any up arrow n. So if there is an integer n, a natural number n, so that upward arrow of n is not in that upward closed set, that means you've got only finitely many values of these things, and it must have this shape. Um, it's a bit hard to express this, but typically you would have to say it's the upward closure in L of the upward closure of N as an element. Uh, there's some kind of uh, notational problem here. Okay, some people actually say, oh, this this is the upward closure in the set X, and this is the upward closure in the frame L. Uh, so that's the first kind of. Uh, upwards closed set, and you can check that it is actually completely prime filter. Well, all the, the ordering is total, so everything is a filter. Anyway, every upwards closed set is a filter. So the only thing is completely prime. So if you take any family, so any supremum is inside it. If your family is empty, the supremum is bottom, and bottom is not in there, so that's fine. Um, if you take any other family, well, you can realize that um, that family will be a chain okay, going up. And if you reverse everything, you've got a well-founded ordering. Okay? So, you, so if you reverse things, you can't go down infinitely uh, uh, often. So that means that if you go up, you can go up infinitely often. And that in particular means that, in fact, every infinite family is actually uh, a family which has a maximal element, unless it's empty. And so, if that, uh, um, if that family is empty, I already said what happens. If that family only contains bottom, uh, that's fine. Uh, there's, it doesn't meet that. And the only f uh, families that meet that blue set are families whose maximal element are, is inside that blue set. In particular, that maximal element is the blue set. So, we found a UI in the set. Okay? And the only other upwards closed set that you can have, that would be a nice opportunity to change colors. Uh, well, it's the whole set here. So it's the whole set of up arrow ends, n in big N. That is upwards closed. Okay. I'm not considering the whole set with bottom because, as I already mentioned, it won't be prime. Okay. But that blue, uh, sorry, green set containing all elements except bottom is a filter. It's a prime filter. 
and let, let me reuse my argument, any family here which is non-empty, the empty case I've been dealt with, mm -hmm. will have a maximal element, and if this maximal element is in the green region, then again, that maximal element is an element of the family which is in the green region, so it's a completely prime filter. Okay, so now we find new notations for these elements. Let me decide to call that funny n with two arrows just n. <laughs> Let me decide to give a new name to that new element. Let me call it omega. Okay. Uh, why am I doing that? Well, last time I had told you that there was an equivalent characterization of T0 spaces through the so-called specialization preordering. So, um, let me put that here as an insert. Specialization preordering on any topological space. This is defined as a point X is below a point Y if and only if for every open neighborhood of X, so for every open X, if X is in U, then U, Y is in U. And I had told you that X is T0 if and only if that specialization preordering is an ordering, that is, it's anti symmetric. So when I proved that PT of of X is T0, I did that without the specialization preordering, but it might be interesting to see what that specialization preordering is. Um, well, X is below Y, by definition, if and only if for every U, if X is in OU, big U now, then y is in O big U. And we do exactly the same proof. That is equivalent to for every U in O X, U is in X implies U is in Y. And that just means that X is included in Y. Okay? So the specialization preordering, in fact ordering uh, of PT of O of X is inclusion. So let me draw PT O of X in that case. Um, what is okay? What is blue arrow up, blue up arrow of the black uh, up arrow n for n equals zero? It's all the elements that contain up arrow zero and only that. So it's a very small set. Pt o of x. So there's an element. I will uh, remove the colors. Okay, it's a bit uh, <laughs> painful. So there's uh, double up arrow double up arrow, up arrow zero, which I've decided to rename zero, by the way. And then you've got the set which contains up arrow zero and up arrow one, which is blue up arrow of up arrow one. So that is above double up arrow 1, which I've decided to call 1. And that seems promising, because we seem to retrieve something isomorphic to the original space. And then, of course, we get all the natural numbers, but there's an additional element here. Okay. And that element is actually the largest one. It contains all the others. And it's omega, and I've named it omega, because it's actually an infinity. It's a new infinity we've added. So in a sense, what we've done is a process of completion, which typically, you can imagine that there was a missing limit here. Yeah. All these natural numbers tended to something, but the, that something didn't, didn't exist, and we've added it. Okay. So for now, the only thing is that for some spaces which lack some limits, you don't retrieve the original space. In fact, what this process does, and that process is called sobrification for a reason I'll explain later, uh, is something that 
adds as many points to the original space as it can, on the condition that it remains T0 and the set of open sets remains exactly the same, which is what we want here. We want the set of open sets to be exactly the same. So we want to add as many points as you can while not disturbing the open sets. Uh, Johnston had a funny explanation of the kind of thing we are doing here. He says, well, um, the importance has traditionally been given, been given to points in uh, topological spaces, but there's also open sets, which are a kind of glue between the points, and it should be treated on an equal footing, or well, actually, in Johnston's opinion, it should uh, probably be given priority. And uh, typically, what we've done is remove all the points and just keep the glue, and then I've I've given you the glue and I've told you where are the points, and then you're adding all the points that you think are compatible with that glue. Yes? And if, if you add an omega prime next to omega, it's not no longer T0 or something? Uh, where do you... So I'm asking this because you said you asked... You okay, asked, uh, as I could ask you a question to ask you where you want to put that omega prime, next but actually the question is ill-posed because I have not even told you what the topology on that was. Mm. So I could tell you what it is, um, and then I could try to answer your question after suitable modification, perhaps. Is it simply the Alexandrov topology of omega prime? Is it what? The Alexandrov topology. No, it's not an Alexandrov topology this time. Uh, if you look at the open sets, and I won't do the complete exercise, um, you realize that okay, there's the empty set. The whole thing is, of course, an open set. That is an open set, and of course, all these are Alexandrov open. Okay, but if there was a red pen somewhere, I'm sure it yes. But the Alexandrov open, which contains just omega, is not open in that topology. So, this is why I put it in red, it, it's not open. The only open sets are the ones written in red, in black, sorry. Plus the empty set. Exactly, because we don't want to add any open sets, and this one was. Exactly, you, you, you can't add any open set. So these are exactly the same ones as the ones we had earlier. Yes. Uh, by the way, it turns out that that topology where you have all um, upwards closed sets except this one turns, turns out to be equivalent to something called the Scott topology of the ordering on that set. And there's a mm, deep reason for that which uh, Simon knows already, uh, which is that uh, the sobrification of an Alexandrov space, sobrification being done this way, uh, is exactly the ideal completion. Uh, so an Alexandrov space is always uh, start, starts from a poi set, and uh, what you get is the ideal completion, and the ideal completion comes with its own topology called the Scott topology, and not only the elements are the same, but the topology is the same. So the topology we get by sophistication is also the topology of the ideal completion. Um, but uh, it's a bit advanced for what I'm explaining now. Okay, so now the answer is okay, negative results. Some spaces you don't get back. So what are the positive results? Well, the first one, let me erase some of these things. This may not be, uh, this may not look like much, but there's a map eta from x to PTO of x, and you know what this is? It maps a point x, a point in the usual sense, okay, to the corresponding point here, which is nx. Remember that we had done all that construction to imitate the properties of nx. So nx is a completely prime filter. Uh, this map has plenty of properties. It is continuous. I haven't defined what a continuous map <laughs> is. Um, we started out uh, a few weeks ago by saying that topology was about convergence. So the initial idea was a continuous map 
is a map that preserves limits. That's fine. Except with topologies, and I could prove it, but perhaps not today, I don't know. I have to concentrate on something. Um, that property of preserving limits is a complicated one. You have to say, well, for every, uh, I don't know, uh, filter of things, or for every net of something which converges to a point, then uh, the image of the net or the filter by f also converges to f of the limit. Okay, it's a big uh, quantification of uh, uh, big sets. Okay, and you can then take that definition, simplify it a bit, and you realize that continuous is equivalently characterized as f from x to y is continuous if and only if for every open set of y so I usually call the open sets of x u and the open sets of y v and the open sets of z w and I never have more than three uh, topological spaces <laughs> unless I and in that is the case actually I, I use subscripts okay so for every v the inverse image of v by f is open in x and that's a definition that usually puzzles people a lot because they say oh, oh funny f goes from left to right and you have to say something that it goes from right to left well uh, that's exactly what mathematics tells you okay Um, okay, so let's check that eta is continuous. You have to check that the inverse image of an open set here, but the open sets here are all the form O sub an element of O, of OX, which is big U. So that is a set of X's such that NX is in OU. That is exactly the set of elements X such that, okay, NX is in OU, let me remind you of the magical formula here. That is exactly the set of elements such that u is in nx. And now we use the definition of nx. u is in nx if and only if x is in u. So that is u, which is open. Again, the baby toy, you know. <laughs> square thing, square thing here. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it has more properties than that. For example, it is injective if and only if x is t0. It's injective if and only if, if you take any two points with the same set of open neighborhoods, then these two points are equal. That's the definition. And it has another funny property, uh, which I gave a name to in my book. Uh, today, I'm not particularly happy of that name because I, I realized years later that I had used a name inspired by a use of that name in a paper. And that the property I use it for is not equivalent to the property of the original paper, which is a problem now. Um, but anyway, I'm going to use that. So I'm saying that eta is almost open. <coughs> and that's a funny property. Almost open is a kind of converse of that. Oops. So a map F is almost open. <coughs> There's a notion in topology of an open map. An open map is a map such that the direct image of an open set is open. And that has considerably less, Im um, less importance than continuity. Almost open says, no, no, it's not the direct image that's open. Uh, but for every open set in X, that open set can be written as the inverse image of some open set. So there is a v open in y such that u is equal to f minus 1 of v. Um, i tell you why later this notion is interesting. For now, we just verify that eta is almost open. 
Well, for every u open in x, there is a v open in v such that u is equal to eta minus 1 of v. And you don't have to look far to find it. I want to find a v such that eta minus 1 of v is equal to u. So yes, I have it. It's just O sub big U. OK, uh, why is it interesting to have an almost open map? I will have to explain something about subspace topologies now. Before you do so, yes. Uh, is there a connection in general between continuous injective and almost open that two of them implies the other? No, the three notions are completely independent. Okay, um, okay so I need to tell you what a subspace topology is in pictures. You have a topological space, big Y, a set, which is a subset of Y, and you want to equip X with a topology. It should be as natural as it can be. So let me decide that if you take any open set of Y, I want the intersection of V with X to be open in X. You can check that the intersections, so the intersections V inter X, V open in Y, form the topology on X, and that is called the subspace topology. Not much to say about that, right? So for those of you who love category theory, <laughs> it is the, well, it's not just category, it's not quite category theory. Um, it's the, what, it's either the least or largest, one of them, topology that makes the inclusion map, so there's an inclusion map from x to y which maps every element here to itself. So if you look at all the topologies that make this map continuous, okay, so i from x to y maps small x to itself, you realize that i is continuous if and only if for every v open in y, i minus 1 v is open in x, but i minus 1 in v is a set of x's in the small set x, such that i of x, which is x, is in v. So that is just v inter x, exactly what I wrote here. Okay. And so if you look at a topology that satisfies that i is continuous, it should make v inter x open. You take the smallest topology, the one that has the least number of opens. Usually topologists, I don't know why, don't like to say smallest topology or least topology. They like to say coarsest topology. A coarse topology is one that doesn't distinguish too many, too many things. It, it has few opens. The opposite is a finer topology. Finer topology distinguishes a lot of things. It has plenty of opens. Karen yeah. Beth said that's the finest topology, not the coarse. No, it really has as few open sets as you as you want. It needs to have all these sets in it, and we just take them, not any new one. The largest topology is a discrete topology. It's a topology that considers that any subset of X is open. Ah, the embedding. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Embedding. Uh, if you want to define quotient maps, it's exactly the converse. So you, you take the largest topology such that. that is. So subspace topology. There's a nice notion in topology, which is called a topological embedding. Uh, I just say embedding. I assume that because we're talking topology, uh, you know that the, my embeddings are going to be topological. And the picture is, it's a map from X, a small set, to a big space Y, such that if you look at the image of x under f. So f of x can be equipped with a subspace topology from y. Okay, And if f is injective, then 
F defines a bijection between X and its image. It's continuous in one direction. And we really want to imagine that these two things are exactly the same space up to isomorphism, whatever it is. I'm actually de defining the notion of isomorphism for categories of topological spaces. And you want to have that F is injective, so as I said, plus continuous, plus the inverse map from the image to X is also continuous. Uh, so it, for students in um, early university years, that tends to bother them that you also have to check that the inverse map is continuous, and then you have to provide examples by which you have a continuous injective map in one direction, even a continuous bijective map in one direction, whose inverse is not continuous. Let me give you sim the simplest possible example. I'm taking the two element set, okay? with a discrete topology. So the open sets are the whole set, the empty set, and the one-point sets. And I'm defining the identity map. As I said, it's going to be a very simple example. To the same two-element set, but with the indiscrete topology. That is, the only open sets are the empty set and the whole space. That is continuous, OK? The inverse image of the empty set is empty. The inverse image of the whole set is the whole set. But its inverse is not, because um, if you take the inverse map, which is also the identity, the inverse image of the inverse, which is a direct image of the one-point set, is not open here. And then usually in university, you learn that there are some nice cases where you only need to check continuity and injectivity and bijectivity, sorry, uh, in, uh, in the case of compact Hausdorff spaces, which are very nice objects, um, but I won't talk about that today. So anyway, you can check that F is a topological embedding. I don't know where I'm going to write that, but F is an embedding if and only if it is injective, continuous, no surprise here, and almost open. And that is the reason of that definition. Do I do the proof? No, I will leave that as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> to the watcher. <laughs> to the watcher, the, the reader, the whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that if x is t0, corollary, if x is t0, then eta is an embedding. So what I mean by that, you remember that I told you that that pt of O of x construction was a kind of completion. It adds points. And I told you it adds points, but it doesn't disturb the topology. That's exactly what we're saying. We're saying that eta is a homeomorphism, that is a isomorphism in the case of topological spaces, okay, between x and the subspace you get at the image of eta inside its completion. Okay, so now we'll have to decide what I will do uh, in the last seven minutes. Actually, yes? are you sure that uh, eta is even subject here? No, I've just, uh, I've erased the part of the board ah, showing that it's not. I Remember that part. example where I started from the set of natural numbers? Yes. Yeah. And I did uh, the completion, that. and it gave you the set of natural numbers plus an plus omega. An omega. Mm -hmm. So an eta just maps each number to itself. So it doesn't reach omega. Omega is not reached. Eta minus 1 uh, is injective, right? OK, what you had in that previous example, you had 0 below 1, below 2, below, etc. And the so completion was 0 six. below 1, below 2, below, etc. And, and omega. omega. And uh, that was actually equal to up arrow, up arrow, 0. That was equal to up arrow, up arrow, 1. That was up arrow, up arrow, 2, and so, so on. And eta maps 0, well, well maps n, any number n, to the set of open neighborhoods of n, which is a set of upwards closed subsets containing n. And that is exactly up arrow, up arrow n. So eta actually maps this to that, this to that, this to that, and so on. And you have that additional element omega, which is not in the image. 
but still eta minus one from photons on the right to photons on the left is injective, right? Oh, yes. In fact, it's an order isomorphism, so it's even yeah. bijective, and it preserves order in both directions, hence it preserves all suprema, uh, all infima, everything. Yeah, because, I mean, almost open means that it's surjective, F minus 1 yes. is surjective, yes. Yes. And so in fact it's also exactly. injective. Yes. And what about applying eta to the point of the different points? Oh, yes, you can do that, but will you won't do that today. <laughs> Why? It's a bit too long. Uh, let me say that uh, if you start, okay, let me say it shortly. That space has an additional property besides being T0. I said earlier that T0 is not enough. It is sober. And it turns out that if you take the sobrification of a sober space, you get the same space up to isomorphism. So that map is going to be an isomorphism if you start from a sober space. So that's the final answer to our quest, initial quest, which is do we retrieve the initial space? Yes. And the answer is exactly when the when space is sober. sober. But I haven't defined sober. Well, sober can be defined in a number of ways. For example, the easiest for me now is, well, it's sober when eta is an isomorphism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the typical trick of a mathematician, which I use constantly, to put uh, what you need to prove your theorem inside your definition. Exactly. It's very practical. Intuitively, sober means you, you contain all your limits. You contain all, all, what? Your limits. all your limits. That's what you say. Your yes, then you have to say what it, uh, what it means, really. Okay. Uh, it's <laughs> one possible completion, and does it in a very elegant way. But there are other completions. Um, so another consequence of what you just said is that uh, the construction of point of L uh, is, uh, how do you say, idem idempotent? Or? No, the construction PT of O yeah. is idempotent, idempotent, up to isomorphism. So mm -hmm. in categorical parlance, it actually defines an idempotent monad. An idempotent monad being one in which multiplication is an isomorphism, is, yes, is iso, or equivalently in which uh, the unit is both left and right inverse to multiplication, I think, something like that. Uh, there are plenty of equi uh, category theory is fantastic. You never understand anything about it, but it works <laughs> wonderfully. And the decomposition of the monad as an adjunction is exactly yes. the level. Yeah. Um, so actually, I started to say that, but in fact, PT composed with O is a monad, and for the categorical reason that PT is uh, either left or right adjoint to O, uh, adjoint on, on one side, uh, I think it's right. I mean, it's right that it's right adjoint. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, actually, that was the starting point for that. Uh, do I continue or do I stop? Mm, I won't be able to do that. What can you do in two minutes? What can I do? <laughs> Answer <laughs> questions? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I have several choices here. You can say plenty of things here. So, I can continue and give you the structure of the, um, uh, of the adjunction we are actually building. So, the relation between spaces and lattices is not an equivalence of categories, it's an adjunction which is your next best thing. Uh, so there's a well-known motto, which is adjunctions that arise everywhere. That's an illustration. But uh, uh, that motto should be completed to not only adjunctions arise everywhere, but there's a key to understanding most of mathematics, except uh, differential equations. <laughs> <laughs> which we don't care. <laughs> exactly. So most of the interesting part of mathematics <laughs> Which is uh, my preferred one of my uh, one use of my preferred uh, paradox called the true Scotsman fallacy. You know that the true Scotsman fallacy is uh, the example is no true Scotsman would ever do that, and you say, oh, I'm Scotsman and I would never do that, and the retort is, but you're not a true Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> so. You always have to use a vague adjective in, uh, in useful places, like interesting mathematics, <laughs> reasonable assumptions, you know, that kind of adjective. Thank you.
Okay, so let's stop here. Uh, so next time we could do that. I could tell you about uh, adjunctions, monads, yes. and give that as an illustration. Yes. Um, I could also tell you what kinds of interesting classes of sober spaces exist. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I could also tell you that it's only the start of the story. Um, um, after that, we'll realize that uh, that adjunction is actually an equivalence of categories, so that there are two notions which are really two sides of the same coin, which are, on the one hand, sober spaces, and on the other hand, what they are in bijection with, which are spatial frames. Uh -huh. Okay, and but that refines. So, if you are interested in uh, not just sober spaces but locally compact sober spaces, then it also corresponds to something in, uh, uh, on the other side. And if you use compact spaces, there's also something on the other side. And if you use um, stably compact spaces, which I haven't told you what it is, you also get something on the other side, and so on. And it continues and goes on and on. 